Cooler School is brought to you by Odyssey Games, where you can go to get singles for all your Force of Will and other trading card games, as well as these amazing patrons. Thank you for your support. Enjoy the video. Hey guys, it's Paul. Welcome back to the Tournament Report. Today we're going to be looking at the GPs in Singapore and Manchester that happened last weekend. This is coming up a little bit later just because I'm super busy, and because of that reason we also did not cover GP Sydney. Uh, GP Sydney will be up on our Facebook page, which will be down in the description below, so that you can check out the mini Tournament Report I'm going to be putting together along with the deck list from GP Sydney, so you guys can actually take a look at those and, you know, get my thoughts on those sorts of things. If you're new to the game, it's really going to be interesting for you, especially if you are not on our Facebook page yet. Make sure you like it. You're going to see more tournament reports like this. Of course, Teacher's Lounge, the podcast that goes up 9 p.m. Monday Eastern time at around 9 p.m. You're going to be able to see that as well. That's always going to be linked on our Facebook page as well as our weekly uh uh, deck profiles and our weekly feature matches. So if you're new to the game, make sure you go over there to Facebook and uh, follow us. That's going to be really useful for you in the long term. And uh, for everyone else, if you're not liking the Facebook page, I mean, do that. It's a really good idea. All right, and now we're going to get right into the deck list for GP Singapore. Just like in the olden days, we're going to be taking a look at the list side by side, though. So the first thing we're going to notice here is John Hang actually won the tournament with his Lucifer list. And you're seeing the Sword of Lament in his rune deck just to get rid of additional, um, any flipped Jade Rulers, which I think is a very interesting choice over Jet Black Wings. All things considered, um, there's no real board wipe going on in this list. And that's very different, other than the one Belial that he's playing main deck into three. So he definitely wasn't expecting a lot of aggression. Um, but in case he wanted to, he was running three Majin Dark Elves, a couple of the Skeleton Hordes, and of course Jean d'Arc for that more aggressive package. But he included Athenia, Belial, and some of these other control cards, like Look of Corruption, to just sort of manage um, the opponent's field and their resources, which I thought was a really interesting pick to sort of mix these together and kind of do like a mid-range uh, mid control variant of Lucifer um, with no Jet Black Wings. I think they thought that uh, maybe Black Rosario was all they needed. Very different way of looking at the deck, um, especially considering that most decks are either going one way or the other. They're either going hard control or they're going for a more aggressive package here. Newer players might recognize that this is a very different card, Life or Death Struggle. It's basically a soul hunt for two, and if you're not playing a ton of uh, ton of creatures, uh, or if you're playing a Skeleton Horde, and you just want to get a couple of those creatures out, you can uh, play this, get rid of your own Skeleton Horde, and they have to sacrifice a creature at a loss. Whereas you can just bring back anything you want with uh, Command of Life and Death, which everything in this list, ex with the exception of Disgrace Knight all the way over to Belial here, uh, can be brought back through those means, which means that any of these smaller aggressive creatures can uh, can come out through this card, which is really solid. Actually, remembering how to play the card correctly, uh, Disgrace Knight and White Leaf can also be brought back because it's level 3 or lower, which means you can bring back your Ultra Dragon. Um, and if you're looking at Ultra Dragon and thinking, well, he's only playing four red sources, I'm not sure why he's playing this. This card is really solid against things like Brunhild, so if Brunhild wants to flip, or if you're playing against other lists that use things like Command of Life and Death, um, Disgrace Knight, um, pretty much anything that comes back from the graveyard or gets cheated in without it you know, its cost being played, Ultra Dragon will just nuke it. So it's really good in some matchups to have that. Now the question you might have is, well, why is this deck winning? Like, what, what made this deck win? And I think if you look over at um, this second place list, this is actually um, the second, third, and uh, fifth through eighth place list. Uh, there was this, this list was copied three different times in the overall tournament, so we just included the one deck list in the uh, in the lineup down below in the description. But if you're looking at this, you're basically seeing a bunch of creatures that either have to stick on board, like Messenger of the Sun, or you're seeing things in hand like uh, Lorite, Viola, uh, Jupiter, and all these different cancel spells that are really, really good in hand, except if you're playing things like Look of Corruption, and getting rid of those cards right away, uh, it's kind of hard to stick these things to the field. And then of course you have all of this different removal that is just getting rid of all of this stuff, which is really hard to, for any of this to stick on the board. 
And then, of course, if you get the late game and you're able to use Look of Corruption and Awaken it, you're not only taking uh, one card, you're taking another as well. So things like Blade of Faith and Spirit of the Valkyries get ripped out of your opponent's hand before they can actually use them. This deck was actually very good. I mean, they copied it three different times and they all made it into the top eight. So that's saying something. Um, but you can kind of see why uh, John wanted to actually use this list as a means of countering these different uh, green Brunhild lists. All things considered, uh, because all of these cards are huge threats to these. And then, of course, if you're removing their uh, resonators from the field or you're getting rid of their cards in their hand overall, it's really hard to make use of anything. Especially with Athenia. Athenia specifically can get rid of any of these white sources, which means that any of the Blades of Faith or the Spear of the Valkyries just instantly get shut down, and that, they're not really able to play anything unless they get another white stone. They're only playing four, so that's important to keep in mind as well. So this deck was perfectly poised to sort of say, well, I'm either going to get rid of your stones, get rid of your hand, get rid of your resources on the field, and you're going to have to flip Brunhild, and if you do, I'll just kill it with Sword of Lament. So you can bring back whatever you want, but I'm just going to get rid of it. So, uh, overall, these lists are actually pretty cool, but I can see why the Lucifer list had a little bit of an edge in this regard. Next up, we got some other lists that made it into the top eight, and these are all Gil lists. These are mostly the same list, with the exception of the Blue Stone over the Darkness Stone, and then some other minor choices in the different lists, including uh, the two Karura instead of the four Gil Inheritor of the Stars. Now, some of you might be saying, well, isn't Karura just strictly, strictly better than Gil Lapis? Um, and that can be the case some of the time, but the fact of the matter is Gil Lapis has barrier just barrier while Karura has um, issues with resonators that want to target her and get rid of her. So in theory uh, both of these resonators are relatively identical except the idea that you have um, additional resonators um, that function as elements so you can remove them from the graveyard and increase the attack of this resonator without them being able to really deal with that unless they have like a, some sort of board wipe or you're just looking for some way to quick cast something in on your opponent's turn and make use of um, the natural attack and defense that uh, Karura has over Gilapis. Really, both are really good options to use either way, um, but both of these lists made it into the top eight. Shout out to Steve Booten, uh, who came all the way up there from, uh, from Australia, which I thought was pretty cool. Other lists included uh, the one Kyrick list that made it into the top. This is more of a burn variant because you're seeing things like uh, Scalding Breath, Fictitious Fire. I'm thinking they're playing more Fictitious Fire over Scalding Breath because they realized in the long run they were going to be running out of cards in their hand, so they're going to be dealing 800 damage more often than not. And of course, Callus Blaze and Power Spike to um, kind of round out the, the rest of... Uh, what this deck is doing. This card does not belong. Uh, <laughs> Howell's Martial Arts Tournament, that was a mistake on my part. It should be down here in the sideboard. As you can see, there's only 14 cards. This should be in the side. That's my that's my bad. Uh, I was trying to get these all done at one point. <laughs> um, but of course, we're going to go back to the burn aspects of this list because they all get copied by Welser. So if you're able to throw in a Welser uh, with the God Art and you're able to just burn, burn, burn until your opponent's done, uh, then all of your aggression just does a little bit extra damage to put your opponent behind and therefore lose the game. That's also kind of the reason they're playing Neo Berserk Dragon, who uh, when they come in and they die, uh, they deal 10 to the board, but they also deal 10 to your opponent and to you. So make sure that if you're going to side this in, if you're going to copy this list or net deck it for any of your testing, make sure that you realize that uh, Neo Berserk Dragon does do damage to you, so don't use it in a pinch. Um, you're going to want to use it when you already have the tempo going into uh, into end game, so just make sure you know that. And then, of course, we have uh, a Hanzo list, which is very different than some of the Hanzo lists we've seen before. And this is basically kind of what the Lucifer list was starting to do. We were actually missing a card; we didn't know what the other one was. Um, but this is essentially just bringing out some really tough to get rid of uh, black resonators, like Ray the Black Owl that flows over into zero. And then, of course, John de Arc is still just one of the best black resonators we have right now. Faith in the Darkness searches all of these things out and puts them into the field for free, essentially. Um, and that's really, really solid, including your Jizo statues. So if you get one of those, you can just plop it out. And then, of course, you can just drain them to death uh, for the rest of the game. It should be noted here that Speaking Stone is actually a really solid green pick because it is one of the very few stones in the game that has barrier. So Athenia can actually not get rid of this stone. 
Um, that's actually really important to uh, to make note of. But in addition, they're citing a third, so you can do things like table flip, uh, ruin story, uh, fairer spell. It's a little bit easier if you need to go into a more controlling game against something like uh, another green list, or even perhaps on a more aggressive list with things like table flip. All right, we're moving on to Manchester now. So this is the biggest thing you're going to want to notice about this GP. There are two prominent rulers that are being played, and this is the first one. Brunhild has been at the top of the meta for a very long time now, um, but this is one of the variations that is really starting to gain favor, at least in this GP. And the thing you might be noticing here is you all, you have all these black resonators and you have Luke of Corruption. Why don't they just play Lucifer? And I think the reason for that is because you get an automatic, uh, awesome, amazing rune in Odin's Judgment. But then, of course, you can bring back any uh, any of your humans that goes to the graveyard uh, with Ironheart's Summon, <laughs> I think is how you pronounce that. Um, and the reason this card is so good right now is because you have Messenger of the Sun. Messenger of the Sun is one of the best cards in the game currently. And then Black has all these really, really good cheap runes uh, in things like um, Power of Immortality. And then, of course, uh, Tears of the Fallen, which just does a ton of damage to your opponents, like stronger resonators. So you can just run them over with things like Athenia, Azazel, or Astema. And of course, on top of that, you still have Blade of Faith with uh, with Brunhild. So Brunhild herself just has much better access to some of the better cards in the game currently than Lucifer does. So it makes sense as to play her over um, over Lucifer in general. She also has a bigger body, and she's a 12-12 flyer that brings something back when she deactivates. So that's really really powerful. With that being said, if you look in the sideboard for Federico Zappini's winning list, you're going to see things like another Stone of Faith, um, a Stone of Omniscience. If you haven't seen this stone before, it's really similar to a multicolored stone in that it can produce any color. The fact is you can only use that color um, that you produce off of this for runes. So you can splash in any different kind of rune that you want in the main list, including Tears of the Fallen, and suddenly you have access to some of these really decent uh, runes that you can play in combination with Messenger of the Sun. And then you're drawing cards off of that. And if you can play multi multiple of these cards a turn, you're drawing multiple cards. And then if you have multiple Messengers of the Sun, you can kind of see how this train gets rolling. And because we're not seeing a ton of Lucifer right now, I think it's safe to say that Acolyte of the Sun can come out and produce uh, the, the will you need in order to sort of plop out some of these stronger resonators earlier in the game. So suddenly, not only are you drawing a bunch of cards, you're summoning these really, really good resonators that are starting to do a bunch of damage to the board and set your opponent's tempo back. Now, if you want to sit down and actually compare these lists, you're going to see that these lists are really, really similar. The only choices that you're going to see that are a little bit different are some of the changes, like Power of Immortality might be in different numbers. Your number of Belials, um, some decks that uh, you're going to want to have multiple Belial on the sideboard, um, or you're going to just want to have one. So it really depends on your playstyle and what you're looking to do. So the second ruler we're going to be wanting to look at at this particular GP is Hanzo. And what you're going to notice is there's very few green cards in the main deck. And that's because this is just an old school Hanzo Machines list that um, is just getting updated with things like uh, Guinevere, Camelots, and a bunch of other cards that can that, that they can make use of, including Divers of Evolution and Mystery Box. And the Mystery Box is something we actually saw on the channel. If you want to look at that, uh, it's going to be down in the description below. Um, <laughs> you want to see a deck like this run. It's actually really hilarious how Mystery Box can just do uh, really ridiculous things. It's super cool. Definitely check it out. And some of you might be wondering, well, why Hanzo instead of Arthur? Um, and that's because Hanzo actually has some decent runes that you want to make use of. That's Whirlwind Technique to give something barrier. So if they're trying to get rid of your, you know, uh, if they're trying to play something like uh, a Kiza's Call or an Erendite or even just get rid of your Lancelot altogether, you just give it barrier really quick. Of course, uh, you would need a green source for that too, so I'm not really sure how they're playing this necessarily. It might just be a filler, but then you have Ceiling Scroll, which is a zero cost, just stop a rune from activating, which is probably the reason uh, this play these players wanted to play Hanzo over something like Arthur or Loki, because this card overall is just very, very strong. 
The other thing you're going to notice is that they're siding Sky Round and the Lost Forest uh, because they're actually playing Pied Piper and they don't want to slow down the deck. Like Sky Round is great and all, but if you're playing Mystery Box, you don't want to whiff on the Mystery Box play. So you want to make sure that all of your you know decent stuff is in the side, uh, including Arendite, which is really good against the Mirror, but it's also really good against Black because of things like Athena, Azazel, and Astima, which might have really good. Uh, which will have really good enter effects and you know mess with your tempo a little bit so yeah what we're seeing here is a is a pretty definitive split between uh brunhild using more of lucifer's support cards and hanzo using more of arthur's support cards and i think the reason blue is in a pretty decent position right now is because of things like erendite um which are really good uh counter meta cards right now and they might even see their way into the main board depending on how um, mystery box is in terms of its playability. So I'm kind of already getting into my thoughts, so we'll just move on to this right now. And of course, I was already talking about Arendite and how Arendite is actually a really powerful card right now, considering things like Athenia and Astima, Azazel, other enter abilities are really strong right now. And Arendite is a one mana answer to most of that stuff. And if you're late into the game, if you're going for a more mid range style and you're being slowed down, but you want to slow their tempo, getting rid of an Athenia with an Awakening is really, really good. Because if you awaken this card, it just outright destroys the Resonator. Really strong play. In addition to that, you have Keys' Call, which is a card from, uh, of course, the Rhea Cluster. And this card is actually decent too. So if you're playing another blue list and you're like, I just need some additional draw power, Keys' Call is another really good way of getting around that. Although most people are going to opt for Arendite because it has the, the destruction mode that you can activate. Uh, depending on where you are in the game, where Skeezus Call, it draws you a card, which is nice, but if you're not really hurting for cards, uh, it's fine as well uh, to just run Arendite. Next up, we have Skyfall, um, which basically becomes the path we part in your hand if you're playing uh, Machines, which is really solid to have, all things considered, because then it just puts a, puts a Resonator back into the owner's hand. You can do some nice battle tricks. You can uh, play a Lancelot, load up your field with a bunch of plus one, plus one counters, and then, you know, in the battle step, if they're about to block with something, you just Skyfall their Resonator back to their hand, and you can probably just win the game and outright from there, which is really solid. And then of course, Lorite does all the things that Keys' Call does, um, except it hits activate abilities in addition to that. But of course, it's running, you have to run green to play uh, Lorite, which is okay. Um, Lorite is a decent resonator and it's a decent card. It's just basically Keys' Call, but it's a body. And then of course you can run um, uh, the Seven Disciples if you want to kind of capitalize on you playing Lorite from your hand, uh, but of course it's quick cast, so it's a resonator that's one of the more powerful resonators in the format currently, and so people might save their fair spells for this card. So you have to be careful um, against, you know, any other list, like any Brunhild list, this card is really potent against them, so you're going to want to look at this card as well and make sure that you're using this adequately. With that being said, uh, Athenia, really powerful resonator. Um, and if you don't have a Resonator to banish, um, you basically just have to get rid of one of your uh, Magic Stones. So this card comes in and it's a really solid 12-10 uh, body. And then, oh my gosh, getting rid of this card in general is just, it's really hard to like want to destroy one of these because you have to minus yourself. So you're basically going um, minus two to get rid of this one card. And then of course, uh, Resonators, your opponent controls gain minus two, minus two into the end of the turn. And if you have more runes uh, active than your opponent does, uh, at like around four or so, you're going to be doing minus four, minus four. Multiples of these on the field basically say, you know, you don't get to play the game anymore because you don't get to stick any resonators. Athenia, really solid. And uh, of course, she's a human as well. So there's some, some compatibility with Brunhild and some other support that Brunhild has. Of course, playing her is also something interesting because you can use her with um, the Stone of Faith, which makes it harder to get rid of her on the chase. And then you have Azazel, who's also been just like a really solid flying resonator. And um, if you do your job right, and you get rid of a, lot of, of a lot of cards in their hand, this card just becomes cheaper, and then it just gets rid of your opponent's cards as well. So this, this card is really solid. It's a really decent four drop. And then of course you have Power of Immortality, which boosts your uh, attack stat and then gives you the ability to come back if it dies uh, at the end of the turn, which is really really good uh, power of immortality as a card 
it's not that difficult for Brunhilde to utilize this because it only requires one black mana to activate. So this card's really potent and it can go in any side deck right now pretty much for the most part. Especially if you're running things like the Omniscient Stone or if you're running a black source. And then of course one of the granddaddies is Ruined Earth which gets rid of one of your opponent's magic stones. We already made um, kind of an observation in that some of these decks only run a few stones of a different color. Speaking Stone not being one of them that you can target because it has barrier so ruined earth as a card is very decent especially since it gives a minus four minus four cloud effect to your opponent's field on top of athenia that's really really strong really solid um mid-range pick card and it gets rid of your opponent's resources the card's really solid right now so overall you're seeing a lot of white getting support uh, with things like blade of faith but darkness got a lot of really solid stuff as well and now that we're moving into uh, this format when we're starting to see the meta shift a little bit into this uh, what Ryan Miles called the the pentagram or the star format where all these different decks are sort of moving gravitating around we're starting to see innovation so you're gonna start seeing things like black Brunhild or blue Hanzo machine starting to run around a little bit um, and that being said what does the meta look like going forward well currently it looks like these two these two are still um, the top rulers of the format based on the support they received however Hanzo isn't really using table flip as much right now as a, according to these GPs anyway he's more using some of the support that we got from blue but Brunhild is still really strong because of blade of faith uh, messenger of the sky um, sorry messenger of the Sun um, mostly because of all of the different runes you can run things like Reign of Tears, and then there's Power of Immortality as well that you can cast from hand, or you can use it from your rune deck. So you just get a ton of, of card advantage for off, off of these very small cards that do really powerful things to the overall game. So currently we're kind of seeing Lucifer and Machines in like a tier, like a tier 1.5, tier 2, like they're pretty darn good, but they're just not quite as good as Hanzo. Um, but they're still top tier threats. So like where do those fall? Probably in between tier two and tier one, um, if not do just tier one in general. But um, in general, like it seems like Brunhild does Lucifer's job a little bit better right now. And it seems like Hanzo is able to utilize machines in a very anti-meta sort of way um, because of things like Erendite and Keys' Call, uh, Skyfall, and all these really good blue cards that are starting to become relevant because of the way the meta is shifting. And then we're starting to see that Gil and Kyrick, they're, they're all right picks, like if you are definitely a really good Kyrick player or a good Gil player, you might want to keep playing those decks in general, but these are probably not the decks you're going to want to pick up unless you um, have some experience running them against this style of meta. Kyrick is one of the easier rulers to use, but in general, these, these rulers and some other rulers that we haven't really seen that much around are kind of falling to the wayside. Uh, Gil really has a hard time with this card. Things like uh, like Lucifer and Brunhild utilizing these different discard options and having these really big resonators that can block Karura or even block Gil Lapis, they're really hard to get rid of for Gil. So um, these rulers and some others are going to have kind of a more difficult time. They're not necessarily bad picks, but they might have a more difficult time going into the future. So looking forward, things like GP Paris are coming up soon. There might be some other tournaments on the docket that you might be going to. So where do you see the meta shifting? Let us know down in the comments below. I definitely see it still hanging around Hanzo and Brunhild at least until May and we get a new set of cards um, near the end of that month. And I'm not really sure how else the meta changes, but um, Ryan Miles definitely thinks that there's more of a star sort of style of format happening between things like Machines and Lucifer and uh, different Hanzo lists and Brunhild and... You basically um, have to keep looking at the meta, keep thinking about how people are going to approach the meta, and you really have to get into um, people's heads when it comes down to what you think they might play. Overall, I'm really enjoying this format. I'm, I love watching it evolve. I love that machines are like a thing, like they're actually decent. Um, and, you know, I just keep looking at this format and I keep loving it. It feels really wide open, really diverse. Even though Brunhild and Hanzo are at the top, they don't seem like decks that can't be defeated necessarily. Um, so anyway, guys, uh, this has been Paul. Hope you enjoyed this. Don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe down below. The description will have all of your deck list needs. And of course, look on Facebook for GP Sydney. We're going to be uploading that fairly soon after this video is done. So definitely head over to our Facebook page, link down in the description below. Give us a like and stay tuned for more tournament reports 
deck profiles, and everything else that we do here on Ruler School. See you guys.